It's really about opening it up uh, and having us, uh, giving us more opportunity for larger scale events. Tonight, new plans for a troubled park in Winnipeg. I'm afraid that come the end of the week, there will be a group that's left behind. An advocacy group appeals the eviction of a group of people who live under a Montreal bridge. Almost every season has been, I think, shot on First Nation lands, and so that's sort of a common theme uh, among the different episodes and different seasons. And a new reality series is set in northern Saskatchewan. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. A remote Manitoba First Nation has filed a national class action lawsuit against the federal government. St. Teresa Point filed the $5 billion statement of claim this morning over what it calls the deplorable state of housing. APTN's Leanne Sanders reports. We should not have to be here today, though. But Canada's continued failure to address our housing crisis has left us with no choice. Chief Elvin Flett says St. Teresa Point's lack of housing forces multiple generations to cram together under the same roof. It is normal for our two bedroom houses to be occupied by more than 12 people. And in one instance, we actually have one four bedroom home which is occupied by 32 people. Michael Rosenberg represents St. Teresa Point and says there are two parts to the action, one addressing the past and the other the future. It could rise as high as $60 billion, depending on how many First Nations sign on. The past is compensation for hardships, hardships of the sort you've heard about today, uh, that no, no one should have endured. And that means compensation for the First Nations, for the loss of their communities through inadequate housing. It also means compensation for their members who personally endured those hardships. Rosenberg says the second part is about Canada following through on the treaty promise of housing. And so the future is about recognizing the rights that those promises have created. And if necessary, Given the urgency of the situation, Chief Flett and St. Teresa Point will seek injunctive relief to compel Canada to recognize the urgency of the situation and the need for immediate action. Rosenberg says the next step is to get the class action certified in court. Uh, Chief Flett uh, and St. Teresa Point First Nation call on those who have been affected by this housing crisis to share their stories because ultimately, as this case advances, it will be about telling those stories uh, and ensuring that Canadians understand what is happening uh, in those First Nations that are suffering the most dire housing crises. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Winnipeg. First Nations policing services in Ontario are in a state of crisis. Three Indigenous police chiefs joined NDP MPs on Parliament Hill on Monday, calling for immediate action. Here's Annette Francis with more. Thank you very much. NDP MP Carol Hughes said there's grave concerns over policing in 45 First Nations. The call for action is in response to the federal government not renewing a policing contract on March 31st. Uh, this is leaving more than 30,000 uh, people in those Indigenous communities without police service. And uh, it will leave them without police service come the end of June because that's when the, the funding that they've been using up uh, is going to expire. Lawyer Julian Faulkner says with no contract, policing services are now running on fumes. He claims that negotiations to renew the contract failed because specialized policing is not being considered for funding. Allowed. They're prohibited from having police services that have basic police units, like a domestic assault unit, like a homicide unit, like an emergency response team. They're prohibited from having that. 
Kai Liu of the Treaty 3 Police Services says the drug abuse, domestic violence and a continued suicide crisis will not stop if the services cease to exist. He says it's imperative that negotiations get back on track. June 5th, the Treaty 3 Police Service issued our last paycheck or paychecks to our members based on the funds we have in our bank. Right now we have no funds left and so we are living on a line of credit. And for those that have line of credits, you know there's a limit. Indigenous Chiefs of Police of Ontario. Who NDP MP Lori Udalut brought up the issue during question period on Monday. Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino responded. Uh, that I've had constructive discussions with Chief Kailu uh, over the course of the weekend and I want to assure all members in this chamber that we are committed to resolving the situation as quickly as and as respectfully as we can. Faulkner says the matter will go to the federal court this week seeking an injunction to get emergency funding from the federal government. Anna Francis, AP10 National News, Ottawa. An update now on a story we brought you last week about a park in Winnipeg's downtown that many consider unsafe, while others call it their community and home. Today there was a celebration as the concept plan for the redesign of the park was unveiled. The event coincided with the annual planting of the Indigenous Garden, now in its ninth year. The reimagining of the city-owned Air Canada Park would see the creation of spaces that would take the form of a turtle. The $2.5 million project involves concrete removed, including the pillars in the fountain, to be replaced by an artificial turf gathering place. It's really about opening it up uh, and having us, uh, giving us more opportunity for larger scale events, for a stage, and still keeping some of the green space in the trees because we have a lot of concrete in our downtown. So we want to make sure that this is still an oasis. Um, and also we're looking at how can we improve safety in the park. So different sight lines uh, and more visibility. And the more people you have in a park, typically the safer it is. Teresa Bauer is one of the people who lives in the park. She's unsure what she will do when the construction gets underway later this summer. Bauer said today she wished they would leave the park as is and turn the fountain back on. She says uh, people plan to take the fence down when it goes up. The possibility of that happening was not something the designers or the downtown biz wanted to discuss today. You can read much more on the park on our website at aptnnews.ca. Meanwhile, a judge in Montreal ruled the people living under the Ville Marie Expressway need to leave by June 15th. So the Ministry of Transport's construction work can proceed, but plans for an appeal are underway. Resilience Montreal, an Indigenous homeless organization, announced they are appealing the eviction order with the help of a mobile legal clinic to let people stay under the bridge for another month. Resilience says half of the people at the homeless camp, some of whom are Indigenous, are two to three months away from getting long-term affordable housing. Nakset says evicting them will eliminate their sense of community safety and make it harder for Resilience to reach them. I don't think it's a lot to ask in a city that says that they don't leave anyone behind. I'm afraid that come the end of the week there will be a group that's left behind and it is going to be harder for resilience to follow up. A land claim signed nearly 40 years ago is being celebrated. We'll have that story and much more coming up after the break.
Uvi Alouette is uh, celebrating the signing of their land claim settled 39 years ago. The final agreement was signed on June 5th, 1984 in the Western Arctic community of Tuktoyaktuk. It covers six communities along the Mackenzie Beaufort Delta and the Beaufort Sea. APTN video journalist Carly Schogner has this feature report. This, this is literally our culture. People are celebrating today um, of our Inuvalu'ik culture. Keep our culture alive as long as we can. Happy In 1984, the Inuvialuit final agreement was signed and it was a very big accomplishment for us Inuvialuit for a whole lot of reasons and having celebra celebration events on the 5th is just a sort of a significance of um, what we are and how and what being Inuvialuit means to us. There was events such as goose plucking, and in May we just finished the spring hunting season and there were many geese harvested and a lot of family time was spent together. There was goose calling of course and you cannot get geese if you don't know how to call a goose, right? So there was um, foot races and just a lot of events to try to test your endurance, your ability your talents, your skills, such as making bannock, which is very good, to, that goes with tea. So, I mean, a lot of these things that we've done yesterday, we do every day when we're out on the camp. Uh, this year I caught my first fish ice fishing in Husky Lake. Really? Do you think it's important to make sure that, that, there's, that the fish are healthy in the water? Yeah. No. Because what if we can't live without fish. We need food. Do you and your family eat a lot of country foods? Like, yeah. Do your family ever talk about like how expensive food is in the store? Yeah. It took us all these years to get us to where we are today. We have our land, we have our agreement, we have our corporation, we have our people. We're trying to preserve as much as we could while adapting to this modern lifestyle. I'm just looking forward to a lot more people being involved and grasping the uniqueness of us being in a reality of our land claim. Kwea Naini Carly for that story and to local youth Miley Wolke who helped out with the camera work. Awesome stuff. A recent report is highlighting the perspectives of First Nations, Métis and Inuit youth leaders. The report focuses on reconciliation within higher education and early employment. The report by Deloitte's Future of Canada Centre finds that Indigenous youth with a bachelor's degree increased 85% in a decade, but they are still lagging behind non-Indigenous youth. 11% of Indigenous youth held a bachelor's degree in 2021, compared to 35% of non-Indigenous youth. In all stages of higher education, as well as the job application process, participants also reported biases, uh, prejudices, and racism. With these barriers in mind, some solutions proposed by the youth include making learning environments more inclusive, offering placements tailored to Indigenous students and Indigenous-friendly workplaces. They want to see these successes translate back to their to their families and to their communities and, and to their nations, you know, to, to be able to decolonize and, and to improve their their nation's quality of life and, and, and the move towards sovereignty. And in the in the workplace, um, you know, they're talking about how do we how are we able to uh, access employment opportunities, how are we able to succeed in our careers and and advance in those careers to make a real impact. An Anishinaabe hip-hop artist has taken over a streaming giant's indigenous playlist for the month. We'll hear from Boogie the Beat after the break.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. April Isidore shared this picture of a smoky sunset while heading home from Canyon Creek, Alberta. Thanks, April, for sharing. If you'd like to be featured as our photo of the day, you can email your picture to share at aptn.ca or you can tag aptn news on Instagram. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 26 in Halifax, 8 with rain in St. John's. 7 and showers in Kujawak, 16 for Nain. 28 with showers in Montreal, rain and 22 in Val d'Or. 17 with rain in Sault Ste. Marie, rain and 18 in North Bay. 28 for Thunder Bay, sun's out and 19 in Sioux Lookout. 9 in Churchill, 21 for Norway House. 31 is the high for Winnipeg, 28 in Dauphin. Sunny and 31 for Regina, 29 under the sun in Saskatoon. 29 in Meadow Lake, smoky and 25 for La Ronge. Still smoky in parts of Northern Alberta, 21 in high level, 20 for Fort Chip. 32 in Medicine Hat, showers and 28 in Edmonton. 27 with rain in Kamloops and Penticton. 17 with showers in Prince George, 22 for Smithers. 15 and rain in Old Crow, 15 in Whitehorse. Showers and 16 for Yellowknife, 20 with rain in Norman Wells. 9 in Saks Harbor, 13 in Polituck. 12 in Baker Lake and Cambridge Bay. 2 in Resolute and Arctic Bay. A reality show that follows solo adventurers is hitting northern Saskatchewan and will be highlighting Reindeer Lake, also known as Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation. The series alone sees participants surviving on the land using similar skills that some First Nations have relied on, hunting, fishing, Foraging and crafting tools from natural materials are all part of the show's survival premise. Ten survivalists were dropped off last fall near Reindeer Lake, approximately 220 kilometers north of La Ronge. They competed for a grand prize of half a million dollars, winning by being the last person standing. Executive producer Jeff Sikik says they felt welcomed in the territory. They were really um, blown away with how receptive and welcoming the Peter Ballantyne First Nation had been. In fact, they even did a welcoming ceremony for them, um, for the cast and the crew, uh, like right uh, on day one before they started filming. Almost every season has been, I think, shot on First Nation lands. And so that's sort of a common theme uh, among the different episodes and different seasons. Spotify, the digital music service giant, is honoring Indigenous History Month by trying to amplify the voices of Indigenous musicians in Canada. Well, to do this, Spotify has chosen uh, one Indigenous artist to guest curate their Indigenous playlist and another to be their equal ambassador for the month of June. Anishinaabe DJ and producer Boogie the Beat will be curating the playlist. Daryl spoke with him earlier. Boogie, thank you so much for joining us here in studio. Uh, tell us about this opportunity to take over Spotify's Indigenous playlist for Indigenous History Month. What are you going to be doing? How did it come about? Uh, all of it. Absolutely. Um, first of all, shout out to Spotify. They've been really, you know, giving us Indigenous artists uh, an amazing opportunity, not only to share our own work, but to, you know, shine some light on different Indigenous artists that we listen to personally. You know, um, I got the opportunity to curate this month's playlist for Indigenous Peoples Month. And I included, you know, some of the stuff I listened to growing up, like Buffy St. Marie, uh, Redbone, of course, one of the greatest bands of all time. Um, but also, you know, shine a light on, you know, new Indigenous artists like Ace and Abby, Snotty Nose Rez Kids, Isla Barker, myself, Sebastian Gaskin. So 
Um, yeah, any any chance we get to, to share our music with with the world is is you know it means the world to me, and and I know it means the world to a lot of these different artists. So yeah, all all love to Spotify for sure. Well, you touched on my next question, and that was you know who are some of the artists that you're going to be shining a spotlight on. So you mentioned some of those. So what can people sort of expect from all of these different Indigenous artists, and and why are why did you pick uh, these artists to to listen to? Um, at the end of the day, I just love the music that they're making. Um, I listen to a lot of it on my own time. And, you know, I come from a rap and electronic music background. But you'll hear on the playlist, you know, traditional powwow songs. You'll hear some folk singers. You'll hear some Inuk singers. Um, just, a, just a blend of, of beautiful indigenous artists. And that's what I try to, you know, showcase with this playlist. Because at the end of the day, there's, you know, the list, I could have created, you know, a 50, 100 song playlist with all these amazing indigenous artists and to, you know, to, to make sure it was compiled into a 25, 30 song playlist was, was a lot of, of hard work, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. I think I managed to do it. I think I managed to do a, a good job and include some of the, the music that I, that I really love listening to nowadays. Well, what are your hopes for getting an opportunity like this? What do you hope people take away? Well, what are your sort of hopes around this opportunity? You know, I think for a long time as Indigenous artists or in, as Indigenous people, let alone, um, we, you know, our stories were, were not told from us, from our own mouths and our own languages, right? So as artists and story, storytellers, songwriters, uh, poets, uh, myself, you know, as a DJ and a producer, I, I'd like to, you know, share my own experiences of, of where I come from. And that is, you know, wonderful Winnipeg, Manitoba. It kind of shaped who I am as a human being, it, and it still shapes, you know, my sound as I as I continue forward on my musical journey. So it was important for me, and it still is, to collaborate with, you know, these amazing Indigenous artists. Because you know, I'm I'm not a songwriter. I don't write lyrics, but I do kind of um, let them paint, you know, the canvas. I will lay down the soundscapes. I will produce the beats and I will DJ in the background, that sort of thing. But, uh, when it comes to collaboration, it is, it is very much, you know, um, my job to, to let them speak for themselves and to, mm -hmm. and to speak with these artists, you know, and not for them. So that's very important for me. Well, talking about you, it's a busy time for yourself. You've just dropped a new album, your first album, I believe. Is, is that right? The, the last few weeks here. Tell us about the album and, and what it's like to, to be able to finally release it. Yeah, so my first official album just dropped a few weeks ago. It was called Cousins. Um, and yeah, again, it was very much a collaborative effort. The first single featured uh, my brothers, the Snotty Nose Res Kids. Uh, the second single featured Dreesus, another amazing Indigenous MC, and PJ Vegas. And again, I have you know a lot of great Indigenous talent on this on this compilation, like Sebastian Gaskin, Isla Barker. We also have some drum groups like Northern Cree, Young Spirit. Um, so I was just you know super excited to to be able to put out my first project on uh, in in collaboration with Red Music Rising. You know they've been really kind of a championing indigenous artists like myself. So um, I'm just super excited. The, you know, the reception has been really great and I can't wait to get back on the road to, to share more music with everyone. Well, Boogie, the work that you do is just fantastic. And again, the album is great. So if our audience can check that out, it's a wonderful album. So I want to say thank you so much, Miigwech, for coming in and, and sharing a, a bit of your story and, and what's to come here on Indi with uh, the Indigenous Spotify playlist. So thank you so much. Miigwech, thank you for having me. I was just checking out Boogie's playlist. It's got uh, Leonard Sumner, The Jerry Cans, Kelly Frazier, Jeremy Dutcher. Looks pretty good. I don't have Spotify, but looks like a good playlist. That's all the time we have for your AP10 National News for this Monday. For much more or news anytime, you can head over to our website, ap10news.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.